Hey, it's Jamie Moore here. You're on the Off The Ball League of Ireland podcast. We've just spoken to Dinny Corcoran and Paddy Cavanagh and our third Expos player now has joined us in the studio. Mr Keelan Dillon, how are you? Not too bad, Jamie. How are you? Great stuff. Keelan currently playing for Athlone Town and uh, scoring goals in the first division. They opened their league campaign with a 4-2 win over Wexford Utes at uh, Athlone Town Stadium last weekend. And I'm going to just say this, and this is not because Keelan is sitting beside me, but the best schoolboy player I've ever seen is in the studio. It's very kind of you, Jamie. No, I don't know about that. And no, I'm not saying it because you're here, but uh, you played for my dad for Belvedere I and did, yeah. your Belvedere team. Pierce Sweeney is at Exeter, went away to uh, Reading, was it? Went to Reading for Sean Cavanagh, yeah. now playing for Shamrock Rovers, went Fulham. to Fulham. Darrell Lennon sit at Blackburn, and Adam Evans, now playing for Longford, went to Burnley, he's had a few clubs as well. Yeah. That was an unbelievable schoolboy team, and when you were 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, you, were, you still are, but at that level, the schoolboy level, you were, you were top of the game. Yeah, it's kind of Jamie, as you said. Obviously, that team went on, did really well, won a couple of All Irelands, and you know, got a few of us to move away. And it's a great team to play in, and probably the most enjoyable football we've played, even still to date, was at that time at Belva. Yeah, what were those days like? Given your team was so good, and there were so many like top players in it. Yeah, you know, sometimes you'd even go away with the international team, and it'd feel that it was similar to playing with Belva, there were so many good players. Like I think at times when I first signed, you had players like Sean Cavanagh couldn't get in the team. At times when we were when I first signed there and obviously, you know, he progressed on a bit later and he was always very small at the time, but there were great times and it was a great team to play in and it was always enjoyable. It was like I was in Cherry Orchard at the time, we never quite pipped them for the league, but we won two All Irelands, never lost a game. I think we only conceded one goal in the two seasons, so it was always enjoyable going out playing and learnt loads and they're lads I'm still friends with now until this day look. Yeah we've had a kind of a theme in this podcast speaking to the previous two lads as well just about young players moving away and you know the opportunity that that might give someone or might not give someone but when you're like 14 and you're, you're a top schoolboy player you're an international as well and you know you're playing and everyone is coming to watch you and loads of clubs are offering you trials and, and that sort of stuff what's that like as a kid? Well you think a top dog at the time you know everyone's coming to watch you think you know Nearly at that stage, you're even thinking, oh, well, I'm guaranteed now I move to England. I'm one of the best players in the league here in the schoolboy, and we're one of the best teams around. And, you know, it's great coming to watch you, thinking, you know, everyone's talking before the game. You get to know who the scouts are, and you're thinking, oh, there's, you know, Man United or Derby, West Ham, whoever happens to be there. You're watching out to see who's watching it, and, you know, you're nearly playing up to say, well, right, lads, come on, he's watching today. Let's see what we can do, see if we get away. and that's all you're really thinking about at the time is how can I get away? Is that does that add pressure to you personally, to your parents, to the team managers even? And like I'm I'm not sure on this and I, I think, you know, scouts personally, I don't think a scout should be walking into a park wearing a Man United coat or you know, a Barcelona coat. I think they should be just in plain clothes and eventually you might get to know who they are. But I just think for kids when they start to look over their shoulder, same it's for international there, staff, yeah. Yeah. even at the Kennedy Cup, all the FAI staff wear their FAI and I just think just let the kids take a step back and, and, and play, whereas you, you just said to yourself, you walk in, jeez, there's the man you've got to have, to have to score a hat-trick here, I might not pass that ball because he's watching. Yeah, it definitely does work like that now. At the time, I loved it. The more that we were there, watching, the better I felt. It was like, great, here's another, he hasn't been here before, there's another club now for me to have a chance to try and impress. And I loved that at the time, but I can see how, for a lot of younger players, I was probably at 14 or 15, maybe more mature than other lads might be at 14 or 15 so we could understand how players could be going oh no jeez if I don't play well here today that's it that's my chance gone to ever be a footballer or I just loved it I just took it all in and said great bring them all down let them all come and watch us because we were such a good team and it was hard not to look good in that team and me and Adam scored a lot of goals in them two seasons you were nearly guaranteed every week that we'd get one each we were that far ahead of a lot of the other teams in, in the league so I love them coming to watch, but I can understand where you're coming from with not wearing the the club jacket, and it does put a lot of pressure on some people who, you know, just desperately want to get a move to England. Yeah, just to a, a Marcel, uh, a Marcelo Bielsa's friend job and hiding hiding the bushes, hiding yeah. the bushes <laughs> with a, a, some sort of an invisible cape like yeah. Harry Potter. So you, you're playing in all these games for Belvo and for Ireland, and the trials are coming, and you're going on trials anytime you can, midterm break, sometimes maybe even missing school. Talk to me about that process because it's something that a lot of Irish kids go through. Some get signed, some don't get signed. But you were in a position where, you know, so many people wanted you. It was nearly you going to give the club an audition as opposed to them giving you one. Yeah, well, I went to I went across with a couple of clubs. I was at Celtic, Aston Villa, Derby. Um, I was at Derby five or six times before I actually signed. But 
Mark O'Brien, Mrs. Scout there, brought me over and there was a lot of Irish lads there at the time and I kind of knew after my first week that that was probably where I was going to sign. I signed very early, I, was, I don't think I'd even turned 15 yet. I'd only been to three or four clubs and I just felt that everything at Derby was what I wanted and I was happy to go. It turned out afterwards then that other clubs came in looking for me to go on trial but I'd already agreed to go to Derby because while I was there, all the Irish lads, the facilities they had, how it was sold to me, Mark O'Brien, the scout played a big part in it as well and I just felt that that was the right place for me to go so I was kind of lucky that that ticked all the boxes for me. Any time I went over, I played well, enjoyed staying with the lads and the digs and whatever, and I just felt that that was the right club for me. But I was at other club, like when I went to Aston Villa, I kind of knew after one week there that that probably wasn't going to be the club for me. Just without the feeling I got from the club, I was at Celtic two or three times, and we only kind of went over and played a game and flew home. So I didn't really get a feel for it, but I knew at Aston Villa that I probably wasn't going to sign there. I know four or five other Irish lads went there, so like Graham Burke, Mikey Dren and all signed. So they obviously got a different feeling than I did, but I just knew with Derby that that was going to be the club I was going to sign for. And what impact does all of this process have on school? Because you, and you're smiling, if, yeah. uh, if we can see, uh, you're, you're smiling there. So you're, you're in school, you're playing school by football, you're playing for Ireland, you're going on the trials, but then you've, to, you, you've signed, but you can't go till a certain age and you have to wait and you're still playing club football and, and you, you know your club football level stayed at a, at a really good level. You even played a couple of years up at times, but... Where does school and education fit in? I think the smirk says it all. Yeah, well, in that, like, um, my mocks for my junior cert, I had to go and ask the school to be allowed to miss them because we were away playing a tournament with the under-15s for Ireland. So I actually did my mocks at home the week before everyone else did and was told just not to tell anyone what the, the questions were and what the answers were. And then I had to go in the following week then and in the morning before the other exam started, I'd have to catch up on an exam we'd missed the week before. So for me... And then obviously I went into transition year after my junior cert because I knew there was no point in me doing fifth year. I was leaving. I would have been wasting my time doing a year of fifth year because I wasn't going to do a leaving cert. I was going and I had made up in my mind and that was it, I was out. So I went into transition year and like that, any time clubs came in looking for me, Derby looked for me to go over. I just kind of went and school took the back seat. Yeah. You could have made a fortune... To your, uh, with your uh, classmates, giving them the, the mocks, uh, you know, you could have given uh, them all yeah. the questions. You probably I did. I wasn't quite a street savvy at the time, maybe, to, to monetize it, but I probably should have. Eh? Looking back now, I could have made myself a few quid there. Eh? So uh, you sign for Derby, yeah. and that's the club you choose, and then over the next three years, you spend a year at Derby, a year at Hull, and then a year in St Mirren. How would you look back on, on that time? Look, I'd look back and say I wouldn't be who I am today, or I've learned what I know by not going there. Obviously, I left Derby after a year. I still had two years left in my contract. I just didn't feel that I was going to. After all the great feelings of being there on trial, I just knew after a year that that wasn't going to be where I was going to become a footballer. I wasn't going to break into the first team there. Um, partly probably down to me as well. I probably didn't do myself any favours, but I had just, again, one day just kind of came to the decision that this isn't going to be the place for me and I need to move and get to get to a different environment. And I ended up, I left was actually the transfer, the deadline in the summer. I signed for Hull then, after that. So you go to Hull and you've chosen Hull because you felt that was the place, having left Derby. You spent some time there and then you make another choice to go to Scotland. So just tell us about the time at Hull and again, when you started to realise I need to look at something else. So I went to Hull and obviously they had said to me at the time that, look, I still had another year left as a as an under 18 and they said look we're not going to put you in with the academy they were on different training grounds so like you're going to come straight in here train with the reserves you'll be in around the first team training with them and I just thought well there's a step forward already they were probably a smaller club and at the time than Derby and different facilities and whatever but I thought there's a really good chance now to go and go and push on and get into a first team and like we'd at the time a reserve manager would have been Nick Barnby and then Kevin Kilban took over after that so we were getting it was, a, it was a step up, we were training with full internationals. There's a good few Irish lads there again, the likes of Robbie Brady, Paul McShane, were all at the club at the time. And I just, again, just really felt at home there, but with three or four different managers at the time that was there. Nigel Pearson was the manager when I first signed. He left, Nick Barmy went up from the reserves into the first team. He left at the end of that season and then Steve Bruce came in after that. But I thought it was doing okay, but at the end of the year they kind of said, look, for the style of football we want to play and like they just signed David Moyler who was playing in the middle and they were like that's the type of midfielder we're looking for and he's 6'4 and 
I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> so it just they said, look, you're just not really the fit for us, so you're free to go and look for a new club. <coughs> so then I ended up in I was going to trial around a couple of clubs, played a couple of exit trials, game it all there shot and went up to St. Mirren and went on trial there a couple of times, played a couple of games and decided to sign up there again to try and get a chance to play in the in the first team up there. You're uh, in a seat that's often filled by uh, Mr. Kilban himself, and he was coaching the the whole reserves. Had he just retired, or was he exactly what had happened? And I, I know a couple of years ago I spoke to to him about you, and he uh, he remembers you. And now you're sitting in uh, the same studio he's in every night for off the ball. That's it. Yeah, um, I think he he'd had a couple of problems with a back injury. I think so at the time he was still maybe registered as a player, but was looking at getting into coaching. And I think the opportunity came up then when Nick Barnby stepped up to the first team for him to take over the reserves, and he had us. My the finish of my time there, a lot of it would have been with him, and you know he was only getting only getting started. I think he actually came back to play then after that once he left Hull, but it was great. You know, I grew up watching Kevin playing for Ireland, and you you never think that you're gonna one day be he's taking you for a training session, and or you're sitting in having your lunch with lads like that, and lads you've watched for years, and so he was a great coach, and you know he's obviously moved into this side of it now, and he seems happy enough in it, but. I think he could have made it a decent go at being a coach as well, you know. Yeah, you, you might have a look at that, I'm sure, in the, the future too. So you're with St Mirren. When do you start to realise that coming home is something that you either want to do or you have to do or you feel that it's the right thing to do? So again, I went up there, started off pre-season well. Um, they were kind of in a dogfight at the time down the bottom of the league. They'd finished sixth the season before, but a lot of it was kind of, they spent a lot of the season either bottom or one above bottom. So. You know, he'd sign me as a young player, he knew what I could do when I came in, but maybe they were a bit reluctant then to throw in some younger lads and a couple of older players came in and I ended up playing a lot of time with the under 20s and I'd been to see him and I had only signed for one year. So I was getting up near Christmas and I'm going, look, look, I'm not even training, which is some days, like, what's going on? And he kind of turned around to me and goes, oh, well, look, I'll give you three games with the 20s to try and prove to me that you're good enough to still stay here and at that time I'm looking at and thinking well look if, if, if I can turn your mind in three games you're obviously not that pushed on having me here so and then I was living in Scotland I was by myself it was the first time I'd ever lived by myself and I just I wasn't happy outside of football even I was just going home and kind of sitting around all day like I had mates in the team but they all had families and were all off doing their own thing so I just came you know sitting at home sad every day and I just said, look, I don't know, we went to see him. I'd only played two of the three games he offered me and said, look, I think we're better off just, just leaving this. Like, There's no point in me. It was costing me money to live there, like, they, to pay my own rent. They kind of said, oh, look, you can come up. And if you start doing well, you'll be getting bonuses with the first team, whatever. You'll be able to cover it, no problem. And it was putting stress on me. My mum and dad were helping me out with money as well. So it was kind of costing everyone to be there. And it was going nowhere. So I decided that it was time just to, just to live. Yeah, so when you're at Derby and at Hull, you're still young enough to live in Diggs and, and have a Diggs family and a Diggs lady to cook for you and maybe live with other footballers too. And I know you, you still keep in touch, particularly with the Diggs people you live with in Derby. But then you, you're in Scotland and, you know, I remember speaking to Mikey Drennan and, and others. I, I think um, Conor Pepper, who you would have played against, I think, at times, was in Scotland too, living on his own. And they both spoke about just the loneliness and sadness of being on your own. And, and that's something that's happens to all Irish players and there's nothing there to help them? No, not at all. There still isn't? Yeah, well, like, when I was at Hull and at Derby, you might get, I think, I can't remember the guy's name, but he worked for the FAI and he'd visit around the clubs. But Mick Lynham? No, it wasn't Mick. Okay. There was a guy based in England. Okay. Mick, Mick always did a great job looking after the lads and he, you still see him now on Facebook. Yeah. Anytime someone scores or gets a move, he's always the first one in congratulating them. Yeah. But uh, there's a guy that used to come around the clubs in England and we are talking all football league clubs all the premiership clubs so I think I saw him once in my three years in, in England so he, he, I'm sure he's doing all he can but it's very hard to really get a support in there and when you're 18 or 19 the last thing you want to be going in is saying oh I'm, I'm sad at home when I come, when I leave here and it's a bit you know you're a bit too proud to go in and say oh, I'm feeling this way I'm feeling that way or you're talking to your parents at home or whatever and you're ringing them and saying oh yeah it's great oh, I was in training earlier and you might be just I've been sitting there and my mum came over a lot now. She was regularly over in all my time in England and it was always a big help and it was great. She might get over once a month when I was living in Scotland and 
it was great having them over and it just kind of then, every time she was coming over then I was thinking I'd, I'd love to be back at home with the family or I was never homesick in my time at Derby or Hull or whatever but when I was in Scotland by myself it was kind of like I'd love to be back at home and that wasn't something I'd ever considered before that was that oh, like, I was living the dream I suppose as a footballer and it was uh, if I'm not feeling great today I know I get to go in in the morning and play football but when I was at St Mirren I just I wasn't getting that feeling going into training anymore and you're going in and kind of nearly pretending to be in great form for the lads being outwardly in great form over trying you know trying to keep making everyone laugh and joke and whatever just to go in hide maybe what you were feeling when you were at home you know you mentioned the word proud there and I have the word pride question mark written down here when you do decide that you're coming home and you've been this underage superstar here and you've gone away and at that time you know Facebook and Instagram wouldn't have been as massive as it is now and all of those young players now are like Instagram famous and they get thousands of likes and everything they put up where on that ladder were you when you were coming home and was your pride hit much given you know when you'd gone everybody including yourself thought I'm going to play in England for the next 20 years I, I think if you go over and you don't think that you're wasting your time and maybe that was I, that was how I felt and that was maybe why I didn't do a leaving cert and didn't think about school I was like well if I'm going to do that I'm already thinking that there's a chance I might not make it here so I had to go over and in my head be I'm going to be a footballer that's it and that is the only way to make it I probably wasn't I was thinking that not doing school work is me giving everything to be a footballer. I probably wasn't. I know I was listening to Paddy there before. He was saying the same thing. Probably didn't do himself justice over there. And I would probably say the same about myself. But coming home, you do. You feel like you failed. That, you know, everyone was saying, oh, he's brilliant, he's guaranteed to make it, this and that. But it's just, it does take a big hit. I consider not playing at all when I come home. And I didn't want to come home. I didn't want to be back living at home because you'd have people. I come from a small place in West Mead, and even when I did come home, I was coming home for the summer. I was driving a course, and they were expecting me to be coming home in Lamborghini, Rover, Lamborghinis yeah. and Range Rovers. And people don't really see what goes on. They don't know the ins and outs of making it as a footballer. They think footballers are Stephen Gerrard, Wayne Rooney, and you're on hundreds of thousands a week. So what could be wrong with you over there? We are talking like. I'd probably make more money now working my own job than I ever did playing in England. Because at, until you've made it, unless you're playing in the Premier League or at the top of the Championship, you're not earning huge money. And especially to get there, you're probably like school at scholars at the time, I think the maximum you could be paid was £120 a week or something. And people think you should be coming home in Range Rovers. And it's just, it's, that's just not how it is. So even when you are over there, people are looking down on you saying, look, like, oh, well, why hasn't he played you? He's, got, he's over there two years now, how come he's not playing in the Premiership? And people just don't get that concept of what it actually takes to make it as a footballer. You're on the League of Ireland podcast with Jamie Moore here in studio and it's a fascinating chat with Keelan Dillon about his time in the UK with Derby, Hull and St Mirren. And now back in the League of Ireland playing for Clone, he's also played for Bowes and Longford and Drada as well. And if you're watching this, you're on uh, the Off The Ball League of Ireland podcast on YouTube, you're listening to the podcast or you're listening on the radio on the That's What I Call Sport on 98FM on Sunday. So Keelan came home then in the... You know, after that time in St Mirren, signed for Athlone Town. And I remember watching a game in Richmond Park of you playing for Athlone against Pats and thinking... God, he's still a really good player. And there you are in action for a clone. <laughs> um, I'm not sure when that was. I think that was a couple of years ago too. So you've come home, you signed for a clone. Was Keith Long the manager then or was he...? Uh, Mick Cook was okay. actually the manager when I first signed. And then um, Keith took over. And Keith took over then. And took after, you to Bowes? After 10, took me to okay. Bowes then after that. Yeah. So at Lone, Bowes, Longford, Drogheda, and now back to a clone. And that's all since kind of January 2014. So you're, you're like a League of Ireland veteran now. You're in your fifth season. How do you sum up your, your time with, with those clubs? Coming back to a clone as a young player wanting to make an impact in the league, you did and you managed to then move to a Premier team quite quickly. Yeah, I had the chance to go to some of the other Premier Division clubs at the time, maybe some of the full-time clubs when I first came home, but like I said, I wasn't really pushed on playing at all. I got a phone call off Stephen Kenny to go and play for their under-19s in a, in a friendly game. Just is it Dundalk? Yeah, with okay. Dundalk, just to kind of have a look at me. And we played, I think we played the Ireland under-17s maybe, and I scored in the game and did all right, but Stephen was still like, oh, come in, have a look come up and train, the same with Rovers and Derry at the time, they wanted me to go in and kind of on a trial basis and where I was at the at the time I was, <laughs> where I was at the time 
I didn't really want to go with Trilan. I wanted to be somewhere that wanted me. So Harry Kenny was at the game. He was mixed assistant at alone. He'd known my dad from years ago. So we kind of put two and two together that when he saw the names or whatever and said, look, if he's home and he wants to get back playing, get him in with us. And, you know, as long as he's doing his stuff, he'll, he'll play for us. So that was why I picked to go that loan. And I played every game bar one that year. I was suspended for the last game of the season for four yellows. And that was the only game I, I missed all that year. So obviously Keith came in. I was playing right back at the start under Mick. And then Keith came in and put me into midfield and I had a good season and he brought me to Bowles with him then. Yeah, thankfully now Keaton is back playing number 10 role because I said at the very start, the best underage player, schoolboy player I'd ever seen. And that's where he played there. So back there, and you're back to it alone now. And uh, a rare occurrence at Lone winning a competitive match last Friday, beating Wexford 4 2, New Astro in at Lone Town Stadium. You got the last goal. I think you got an assist as well. And yeah, the town are, uh, have, a, have a win under their belt to start the season. We do, yeah. I think one of the lads was saying, I think the last time they won a game in the league was August 2017, maybe. So all the last season, I know some of the lads that were there last year, even after we beat Dundalk in the Cup, were saying how big it was. Like, that it was huge for the club because they didn't win a game last year. And, you know, as a club, they seem to be doing things the right way now. The new Astros gone in. We've made a couple of signings this year, but, you know, it's all about improving now, kind of consolidating as a club. A couple of problems there over the last year, but I think them days are behind the club now. So it's just really now regrouping. They're bringing through a lot of... 17s and 19s and now the underage teams have won a couple of leagues over the last couple of years and there's a big push on getting local lads in and trying to get the fans back in to watch the games and you know progressing on where they are at the minute yeah and I was a little bit having a joke there to start but you know at loan this season they've had a, a pre-season the manager Terry Butler signed a number of players Mitch Whitty and Jer Gosson in coaching with him as well and you know it's a really good start for at loan and you're down to Cove on Saturday for the second game of the season they began with a disaster and draw that they were well beaten and their bus broke down and, and that sort of stuff and um, you know the first division this year last year and the year before at Lone and Wexford you knew we're going to be the bottom two and the previous year you knew and before that maybe Cabin Teeley but this year you know your club has really strengthened you've gone back a number of other players the likes of you know your Darren Meenans and others like have signed that and you'll be confident you know against the teams the likes of your Coves and your Wexford and your others around to go and beat them and then see who you do against the top teams yeah well that's it I think last year like you said at Lone we're probably expecting to finish bottom maybe or one above with Wexford and this year, you know, we feel we'll have a chance going to play anyone. Obviously, Shell has spent a lot of money, but the teams around us, your Cabin Teeley's, Coves, Wexford, we'll fancy our chances to go and, you know, really have a good crack at beating teams like that. And again, the top teams, the likes of Shells, wherever you can pick up a couple of points against them. Bray, Longford, draw the, they'll all be tough places to go. Cove, even this week, will be, you know, you never know what you're going to get down there. It's, it's not a great place to go a lot of the times, a long travel, pitch sometimes isn't great. So we'll just be looking to get as many points as possible and kind of be competitive in games. I think there was times last year maybe at Long we're beating 6, 7, 8 nil. It didn't prove as the season went on, but I don't think we'll be seeing results like that against us this year. Hopefully now anyway, I'll be saying that. Yes indeed, uh, the results last weekend in the opening weekend of the first division, at Long 4, Wexford 2, which we mentioned, Cabin Teeley nil. Bray Wanderers three, two goals for Dylan McLeod and his, you know, after signing for Bray, one from the penalty spot. Dino Halloran scored as well, having joined the club from Waterford. Drogheda, as I mentioned, beat Cove Ramblers by four goals to nil. Uh, Chris Lyons, one of the goal scorers in that game as well, and you know, for for Chris, you know, Mark Doyle, Adam Wixit, and, and Mark Doyle scored again. Chris Lyons, a top striker in the league. Keen Leonard sent off for for Cove, and their bus was late, and the referee didn't give them too much time to warm up, which I thought was really disappointing. As did the the Cove manager Stephen Henderson on Twitter. A thriller in Galway, thousands of fans down, and the president Michael D Higgins to watch Galway go 2-0 up against Shells Colin Kelly who's only 17 or 18 scored a brilliant goal after 4 minutes it was 2-0 on 16 minutes through Vinnie Farty but 2 for Kieran Kildoff and 1 for Carl Moore uh, Shells uh, won that opening game by 3 goals to 2 and Limerick nil, Longford nil. the only game in the whole of the League of Ireland uh, the weekend just gone without a goal fixtures this weekend 3 games on Friday Bray against Limerick Shelburne against Cabin Teeley in a Dublin derby at Talca Park and Wexford Galway all quarter to 8 on Friday well 2 games on Saturday uh, Cove against at Longwich Keenan will be playing in at 7 o'clock and then at half 7 I'll be in Longford for uh, Longford against Drogheda so uh, that's the uh, first division uh, fixtures and results for the year uh, Keenan finally going back to it alone and mentioned a couple of other clubs you played with Drogheda and Longford where you weren't an ever present in the team how hungry are you to go in and, and really show, like you're only 25, to really show people and yourself that you can actually play every week and, and you know, make a really good contribution to your team? Well, that's it. That was the main reason I signed for Athlone. Like, again, I went and met Terry and he said, 
similar to the first time I signed for Atlone, you need games. If you're coming in here and you're doing your stuff, you'll get them here. It was, you know, I've gone away, worked hard pre-season and in the off-season as well to come back and I just really want to play as many games as possible now, push on, hopefully do, you know, we will we'll improve over that long, but it'll be a good season, there's a good buzz around the place, feels great, coming home on a Friday night after playing, scored a couple of goals, but even with that, just being back involved on a Friday, knowing that you're going to be, either get on or you're going to start, like I haven't had that in the last couple of seasons, you're kind of in and out, you do get back in, you do well, and you're maybe only in because someone's injured or suspended and you do get back in then but I'm really looking forward now to playing as many games and you know trying and contribute whatever way I can and you're also working full time and playing and as you mentioned still a number of years left in, in the legs to play hopefully is there still an ambition to play full time football here or do you have an eye on well I'm, I'm now in a job where I might be able to progress up the ladder and then still play League of Ireland football part time yeah it's very hard now it'd have to be especially a lot of the time now but one year contracts if you give up your job go and take maybe for similar money than what you're getting between the two of them between the two jobs the football and work it would be very hard to say right well I'll go and give this a bash for one year but obviously if I get it, it's easy sitting here saying that when there's nobody asking you to do it but you know if a team that's in Europe full time comes in and offers you full time football it was what I always wanted to be it would again be very hard to turn down but it's a serious conversation I'd have to have with the people around me and see look, is this the right thing to do but if it did come up, I'd probably find it very hard to turn down, come back in to play full-time football, knowing what I know now, having been there when I was younger and maybe not done myself justice, you know. The one word I would use to describe our chat is honest. Is it easy to be dishonest about what you've kind of been through in the last 10 years? Because it's it's so nice to hear, and I hope people listening and watching will appreciate the honesty of, of the story you're telling. Like, Yeah, well, I was actually only having a conversation with, with a young lad down near where I lived the other day, and he was talking about it. Another player who's come back from England, then it was, uh, he's, he's homesick, he's missing home. I'm not saying the lads don't feel that, but if you're flying every week and you're doing everything you can and you're playing, it's very hard to feel homesick like you are. If you're at a premiership club or whatever, if you're playing every week, like I said now, even just being at Atlone, playing every week, you're in great form all week. It makes being away much easier. If you're playing and you're progressing, you're playing up a year above, you're playing in the reserves it does make things easier and it's also easy to turn around and say uh, such and such a manager just didn't like me or face didn't fit but I think if you do everything you can while you're over there I think there is a level that you will make it at and I just don't think that I did enough while I was there to really have a go at it you know Well still plenty more to go Keelan Dillon thank yeah. you so much Cheers Amy yeah, that's just been it now for the latest episode of our Off The Ball League of Ireland podcast. But very finally, of course, a Friday, Monday of Premier Division games last weekend. The games on Monday, top of the table, Bowles won the winners over Shamrock Rovers. Derry City, a thriller up there in the Brandywell, the Ryan McBride Stadium, beating Water for 3-2. Dundalk, their first win of the year. Neil Ferrugia put UCD ahead with two goals, including the Patrick Hoobin penalty, won it for Dundalk. Pats and Harps, nil all at Richmond Park, and Sligo Rovers won. Cork City 2 was the final score in the showgrounds. And the games all taking place on Friday, three of them at 7.45, Cork City against Derry. UCD against St. Pat's again will be covering an off the ball at a quarter to eight in the UCD Bowl. Waterford hosting Bowes in the RSC, while two eight o'clock kickoffs, Finn Harps against Sligo, local derby of sorts there, and it's Rovers against Dundalk. What a game, a Tallis Stadium again, I'll be at it, eight o'clock on Friday. One game as well on Monday, Shamrock Rovers against Finn Harps in the league, plus a full round of EA Sports Cup games on Monday and Tuesday. That's it for episode four of the Off the Ball League of Ireland podcast. Thank you very much for listening and to all of our guests, Keelan Dillon, as well as Paddy Cavanagh and Dinny Corcoran. More from all of those in the podcast section of offtheball.com. And we're back with you next Wednesday. See you, folks. Bye-bye.